No. Good afternoon. I, th I think while our panel is uh, getting seated, uh, make yourselves comfortable for uh, continuation of this discussion. Uh, I'm Steve Litt, uh, the art and architecture critic of the Plain Dealer since 1991, uh, and I cover city and regional planning as well. Um, I don't know about you, but I am personally really grateful to have Tom Beyer in our community and to have his incredible vision and research and the perspective that, that he just brought to us. I, I think it's so incredibly important. And I will commend to all of you a hard copy uh, of his book, which is available at the table over here. They sell for $9 a piece. I'm told uh, cash only today. Uh, they're not uh, taking credit cards, but um, uh, I find it easier to read the hard copy than the, uh, the e-book version. Um, I was so grateful uh, that Tom asked me to read an early draft of, of the book and to talk to him about it uh, because it, it, it brought me or early into his, his creative thought process, but um, I, it was just incredibly exciting to see him pulling together uh, decades of research. and. T to me, I, I, it's just incredible as a newspaper reporter to, to see somebody provide uh, in, in relatively brief form, I think it's uh, close to a, maybe a little over 100 pages, uh, something that I really consider to be a master narrative for our region and required reading for uh, everyone in this room and, and far beyond. Uh, really exciting to see the relationship between home rule, uh, urban disinvestment, uh, the underlying uh, but really controlling issues of race and poverty uh, related to sprawl and all of the, the problems that we face uh, in our region going forward. Uh, we have a terrific panel here to uh, discuss Tom's book, and I see Tom is seated here so he can defend himself <laughs> uh, against um, all comers here. Uh, and uh, let's, I'll just go from uh, my left, your right, uh, coming in this direction, we have uh, developer Peter Rubin of uh, Carl Companies, and I recently uh, had the pleasure of serving on a panel, uh, moderating a panel discussion in Shaker Heights with, uh, with Peter about uh, the Carl Company as uh, uh, owner of Shaker Square and the, the vital role that uh, Shaker Square plays in uh, anchoring uh, the east side of Cleveland and uh, that vital connection to the, uh, the east side suburbs. And uh, next to Peter is Jim Rokakis, Vice President of the Western Reserve Land Conservancy and Director of its Thriving Communities uh, Institute, which uh, in 2015 compiled uh, an incredible uh, collection of, of data about um, sprawl and abandonment and the impact on, uh, on Cuyahoga County. Uh, Next to Jim is Chase Rittenauer, and Chase, you are 32, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> and uh, that, uh, that mayor of, of Lorraine, and you have in your wallet a, um, a business card that with a flash drive on it that has uh, images of uh, your, your proposal to bring Amazon. Do you want to wave that out there? I'd love to see it. <laughs> really into, uh, into props, not on you right now. Okay, it just sounded so cool. I, I really wanted to, uh, to see that. Uh, next, we have uh, Matt Zone, uh, Ward 15 Councilman in the City of Cleveland uh, and President of the National League of Cities, and, uh, and then closest to me, uh, the indispensable Tom Beyer. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, pull together a couple of threads uh, that uh, are important to me and I, I, th I think would be interesting to all of you. Um, I was really uh, grateful that uh, Hunter uh, spoke earlier about the Northeast Ohio Sustainable Communities Consortium and its uh, very important work uh, over the, the three years before the culmination of that project in, in 2014. Uh, not to repeat anything that he's, he said, but um, uh, I was uh, thinking that this, this study is, is so important. Let me take a poll here. How many of you have read it or gone to the website? Uh, Okay, I, I, I would encourage all of you who haven't done that, who are not aware of Vision 2040, 
uh, to please uh, go to that website. Uh, and I'm going to recommend another website in, in a moment. Um, the, the thing that's, that sticks out to me about everything that Tom just said uh, and, and also what's, what's covered in the Vision 2040 document uh, is, is a very, very simple uh, uh, set, set of numbers. Uh, between 1970 and 2010, the footprint, the developed area of the 12 counties of Northeast Ohio, and EOSCC set a very wide net, it was 12 counties looking at, at Northeast Ohio as, as a larger region beyond the, uh, uh, the seven that Tom references or the five in Nowaka. 12 counties expanded the built footprint uh, by 400 square miles. 400 square miles of road, pipe, wiring, parking lots, churches, schools, malls, houses, et cetera, subdivisions, 400 square miles. That was something like a 20% increase in the developed footprint of the 12 counties. Meanwhile, that same geography lost 7% of its population. That's um, from 4.1 to 3.9 million people, if I'm remembering correctly. And I don't know what, what you would think of that if you're a parent looking at a child and the appetite of a child who wants to, you know, put everything on the plate, but, you know, can't, can't manage to, uh, uh, well, it's just taking too much and, and heedless of the cost and the waste that that, uh, that that creates. So that's one thought, one uh, recollection that I have of Vision 2040. And the other is I'd like to send you to the NOACA website, and please do this after today. If I had thought about this a little bit further ahead, I would have shown some slides here. Tom uh, references the, the power of home rule. Well, one of the powers of home rule governments is zoning. If you go to the NOACA website and look under uh, plans and reports, there's a tab on that website, you will find uh, the, a, a county by county report uh, of, uh, based on data taken from the Vision 2040 document. And what it will show is the current land use pattern in 12, sorry, in the f five counties of, you know, Cuyahoga and the contiguous counties. It will show the land use pattern. And not surprisingly, outside Cuyahoga County, for places like Geauga, Medina, et cetera, it's, you're mostly going to see bright green. That bright green is agriculture. That's land use, the way it's being used now. Now you turn to the next page and look at what is the zoning. The zoning for those agricultural acres is housing, subdivisions. And it might be three acre minimum lots or two acre or one acre. They're usually large lots, which probably amounts to exclusionary zoning. But the point here, as, as Tom was, was uh, enunciating earlier, is if you're a farmer, your retirement plan is in place. All you have to do is sell to, uh, to a developer. Uh, I asked the Vision 2040 folks if they could tell me what is the total maximum residential capacity uh, uh, in terms of population uh, under the current zoning of the five counties? And I, I never got an answer, but the, the numbers that were tossed around were well over 10 million. Well, in that same area, we've got, you know, 2.2, 2.3 2 million people. So you can see the, uh, uh, the challenge uh, that, that Tom has, has laid out for us. Um, with our panel, and with that as uh, a context for our, our discussion, uh, I want to mention one, one more thing about those five county reports, which is uh, that they, they really get to the, the issue of why should I care if I'm not in the city of Cleveland or uh, I don't really care about the inner ring suburbs, why should you care uh, about what I just described with the land use and the zoning and the sprawl and the uh, outward migration that we're going to be looking at. Well, you should care because it's going to hit you in the pocketbook in the form of higher taxes. And that is also called out in these five county reports. So I want to tell you that uh, the, the difference between uh, uh, revenue expected by these counties between now and 2040 will lead to an overhang, a deficit, which would have to be made up for in terms of higher taxes. And the estimate for 
uh, Cuyahoga County is that by 2040, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, a, a mismatch of 60.4 percent. In other words, revenues uh, uh, will, uh, expenses will exceed revenues by 60.4 percent. The number is somewhat lower, predicted to be about 13 or 14 percent in Lorain County. It would be interesting to, uh, to uh, drill into why. Uh, but uh, this is going to make our, our county uh, and our region uh, more, uh, more expensive as a place to live and less economically competitive. So if you're not directly engaged in, in urban areas and the challenges they face, that's, that's a reason why you should care. We should all care about this. We're all in this together. Uh, panel members, uh, given uh, the, the uh, description that I've just given you and, and Tom's very moving uh, uh, and, and brilliant analysis of the challenges that we face. I would like to just go down the row here, starting with uh, Councilman Zone, and ask you to say, is there anything that jumps out at you about what I've said and what Tom has said uh, in, his, uh, in his discussion that is just kind of a burning issue for you right now and you want to share with us? Sure. Matt. Um, can you hear me? All right. So um, look at our fragmented way of governing Northeast Ohio. So let's talk about Cleveland, then the county, then the region. You know, in the city of Cleveland, we have 57 cities, two townships. Uh, the ward that I represent, it's the most populous in the city of Cleveland, 28,860 as of the 2010 census. And the ward I represent is one of the neighbor, or one of the wards that's actually grown in population. So probably, I, I suspect we're close to 30,000 about half as many people as, as in Mayor Rittenauer's city. <clears throat> that fragmented level of government, if we wanted to be strategic, if we wanted to be smart to tackle and with intentionality, poverty, education, housing policy, it's time that we move to a metro form of government. I don't know what we're waiting for. Uh, in my capacity as president of the National League of Cities, I'm fortunate to travel around the country. Uh, Louisville is doing some remarkable things as a result of that. Nashville is doing some remarkable things. Those economies are robust and growing, and they're taking care of the poorest people in those communities because they're thinking strategically. In our region, uh, within Northeastern Ohio, there are 845, I think, right, Tom? Uh, taxing authorities. These are school districts, governments, um, and MPOs, regional entities. Those uh, the, the, the GDP of Northeast Ohio is about $170 billion a year. You know what it costs to run those 845 different levels of government? Take a guess. 10% of that, $17 billion. There's so much duplication in what we do. We can do it better. And when I think about how we can grow and preserve, um, it has to come down to smart land use planning and, and revenue sharing. So many things to talk about. I guess I'll start where you, you started, Amazon. If you saw the paper today, the city of Lorraine made a proposal for Amazon. And why did we do it? Because if we didn't, if Amazon relocated to Cleveland, as in the professor's book, we would see very little, if anything, as a result of that because of how income taxes work uh, in our state. Uh, we might see some residents, but we wouldn't see very much revenue. So. Uh, we decided to try to take, a, as I dubbed it, a moonshot, if you will, uh, to try to land Amazon, knowing that it's a stretch. But again, you know, if it comes to this region, the fact of the matter remains that cities outside of Cleveland would not see as much impact as I think the book talks about we, we would all like to see. In the, in the book, it also talks about, and, and the professor and, and you as well talked about, development. And Lorraine is an interesting case because we are, as I call it, we're an urban center. We have more in common with Akron, with Cleveland, um, with, with Canton, with Parma, than we do with some of the suburbs that surround us that we're sometimes lopped in with. Uh, Lorraine is not Vermilion, we're not Avon, we're not Avon Lake, but at the same time, what's going on on the west side of Lorraine is some of what was mentioned in the book. We are seeing new development. If, if I look, if I Google new development in Northeast Ohio, you know, you see Avon, obviously, you see North Ridgeville in eastern Lorraine County, but the city of Lorraine also has a number of new developments occurring to its west side. And 
as is indicated, people are moving up, they're moving out. They're moving out of the central core of the city, they're moving to the further west side on what was at one point farmland. Now as a mayor, I would love to see the redevelopment in the central core, and we're seeing some of that in downtown uh, with, with uh, some, some additional entertainment options and those types of things. But from a housing standpoint, if I am to stop population decline or try to add population, it's going to have to be on my city's west side where people want the new and the shiny. I don't particularly subscribe completely to that theory, but again, I look at the tra trajectory of Lorraine long before I took office, and the population has continued to go down, down, down. How do we stem the tide? People want to move to that west side of the community. And when we want retail options, when we want restaurants and those kinds of things, those developers are counting rooftops. So that is imperative for the city in terms of development. However, another point made in the book that I find uh, to be very true is that the cost of that residential development, while it might help me on the population side, it does not help me on the service delivery side. We have to plow those roads. We have to provide police service. We have to provide fire service versus the city's major employer right now, Mercy Hospital, is talking about building uh, a new clinic in the city that would bring jobs, uh, medical jobs, office jobs. Those are positions that, again, contribute more to the income tax base, yet require less service delivery uh, as it relates to city services. So Lorraine, we, we sort of have both dynamics going on, uh, and it can, make it, uh, uh, it can make it certainly difficult at times. I'll end quickly with this. Uh, I was at a city council meeting, and, and the hecklers that all of you involved in the city government know uh, come to every city council meeting were saying, Lorraine needs to be more like Avon. Lorraine needs to be more like Westlake. And, you know, look, I'm in my second term. I don't mince words. I said, we're, we're not Avon, we're not Westlake, and we're not going to be. We are going to be Lorraine. Uh, we've got some great things going on in the city, in the downtown area. James Levin is here. Firefish just concluded. We've got great things going on, but I, I got a little bit of hate mail the next week because, you know, they, they looked at me as saying, well, you know, Lorraine's never going to be that good. I don't look at it as that. I look at it the same way uh, the professor does in that we are a different city and we require different things than Avon. Um, we are often compared to them, I think unfairly. As Lorraine looks to move forward in its future, I really feel that it is this do-it-yourself survival uh, that the book talks about. Columbus is not helping us. There's, you know, we've, we've talked to them till we're blue in the face. It does not, Columbus is not coming to city's rescues. And mayors, Democrat, Republican, Independent, all can at least, I think, agree on that. So it really is this do-it-yourself survival. And uh, it's certainly uh, very challenging. Reading this, reading uh, the uh, Northeast Ohio Sustainable Communities uh, document should horrify all of us if something is not done. Uh, I live it every day as Mayor of Lorraine. Thank you. Mayor, uh, before we move on to Jim, what are your population uh, projections for, your, for the city of Lorraine and the county? City of Lorraine, we're, we're lingering right around mid-60s. Uh, we actually slightly, I think, gained this last go around barely. So for us, just maintaining is a positive. And it's only because of the west side development. I mean, we see uh, abandonment in Central City. Uh, Jim Rakakis's group did a property survey for us. We were able to knock down a lot of our vacant, dilapidated homes. But that is where the population is leaving, and we're gaining on that west side. Countywide, um, you know, we're at, I think, in Lorraine County, 300,000 right now, and it's, it's projected to keep growing because of Avon and North Ridgeville, and really that, that eastern part of the county, that, as the book talks about, is really taking people out of Cuyahoga County. I mean, Lorraine County's fortunes, good fortune on the east side, is because of Cuyahoga. I would preface, I would say good fortune now. 30, 40, 50 years down the road, we'll, we'll obviously see what that looks like. Well, by 2040, you're, you're, gonna, you're projected to have a mismatch between uh, expenses and revenues of negative uh, 13.5% according to uh, uh, the Vision 2040 document. So maybe that explains why you, you end up looking a little better in the, in the next couple of decades than Cuyahoga County. But uh, that doesn't exempt you from the, the regional dynamic as, as, you just, uh, as you just discussed. No, absolutely not. Yeah, Jim. 
Well, uh, first of all, Tom, I enjoyed the book. I read it. And uh, I'm amazed at your productivity, Tom. I, I read in your brow, you're 80. I want to be vertical at 80, and you're writing books. So I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, really, Tom Dyer. Um, having said that, Tom, you, you, know, you and I have been on a panel that talked about growth sharing, and I think I'm glad you put it to bed here. It's never going to happen, folks. Do not waste your time on growth sharing. Just don't. Tom, you didn't have it in the book. You must have left it out, but you and I attended a couple dozen meetings with Mayor Bill Curran, and you and I were there when people like the mayor of Avon Lake stormed out of the meeting and said, I'm not going to give one dime of my money to East Cleveland. And you were there when the guy from Russia Township stormed out, and when the mayor of Willoughby got up and walked out. It's not going to happen. So it's not going to happen because they're parochial. It's not going to happen because, as you said, they think it's their turn. It's not going to happen because, quite frankly, a lot of them don't have the money they used to have. The state of Ohio has taken away local uh, government uh, LGSF fund has been taken away, a form of revenue sharing. They took away the estate tax for a lot of those communities. Those were real dollars. Um, so, and, and quite frankly, I'm in those meetings, Tom, and you were there, and there were undercurrents, and they deny this, of racism. And more than one of those meetings where people talked about not wanting to contribute their dollars to Cleveland, or they always made it a point to say East Cleveland, right? Yeah. So let's talk about political reality. Forget about that. Now, uh, and, and forget about help, as you said, Mayor, from the state or the federal government for the next four, six, seven years. Let's be honest, we don't control, Democrats don't control either house, either here or in the place in D.C. We know what we're experiencing in Washington. I got a notice today that said it looks like historic tax credits are on the chopping block. Low-income housing tax credits are on the chopping block. New market tax credits on the chopping block. And something very uh, near and dear to my heart, we've been using conservation easements to perform kind of growth controls, as you know, Steve. We've conserved 50,000 acres by using conservation easements. If we lose those, there'll be no incentive for farmers uh, other than the fact that they love their land and they might want to do that for, to maintain uh, their family's tradition. No incentive to save those. So we're really worried about that. And I was saying this at the table earlier. I view, right now, I view the state and the federal government as basically hostile occupying forces. They're not going to help us, and they're going to occasionally lob more than a few grenades our way. So uh, having said that, I think there is a model, and I want to go back to what you said, Tom, about the county. I agree with you, and there's precedent here at the county. Uh, the county committed, and now they're taking some back, but I'm sure they'll correct that on Monday. The county had committed, where's Ken Surratt? Right, Ken? That was just some bad information. You'll fix that Monday. They had committed, they had committed $50 million to blight removal in the county. And why is that? We did a study a few years ago that showed that the loss of value on the east side of Cleveland and the inner ring suburbs had shifted $43 million in tax bills to the more affluent communities in Northeast Ohio. And the former county executive put that money up. Now that money, we have to see through commitment through. We're at about $33 million. We need to see the other 17 through. But there is precedent for the county getting involved in these solutions. And as you know, uh, you know, I, again, I wish Ken were here. There was a program that was started. Is Bob Jaquay here with the help of the Gun Foundation back in 1999? It's called the HELP Program. It was a link deposit home improvement program that has done almost $200 million in home improvements since the program was established in 1999. Program is not dead, but the county has stopped publicizing it. I, every time I'm in a key branch, I always ask the manager, how is that key program working? And to a person, branch managers have said, it's the best thing the county has going. Basically provides very low interest home improvement loans. The county is in a position, Tom, you talk about preserving the, the, the tax base of the county. The county, when they're through doing demo, and maybe simultaneously, by the way, they never did a bond. They just did it out of operating. They should supercharge the health program. We heard about people unable to get loans because their credit scores weren't good enough. The county should supercharge the health program with real money to make the loans in places like Maple Heights and Garfield Heights and Cleveland and other suburbs that really need that additional boost. And the county is in a position to do that. And, and I agree with you, Matt. We need to go. And by the way, I am so, we have the chairman, the president of the National League of Cities right here in Cleveland, which I'm always proud about. And I give a shout out to Matt, but that's pretty amazing. It's almost always a mayor of a major city, but Matt Zone is our guy. But I would tell you that, that, um, that 
short of regional government, sort of short of that. And I'd love to see a government where everybody, you know, Louisville, Nashville, two good examples. But the county can take a much more um, uh, expansive role. And if they don't have the authority to do it, Columbus can do some things, even though they're not likely to give you money, they might give you uh, more rope to hang yourself. Um, you know, they don't mind. When, when we went to Columbus to get the land bank authority passed, which gave the authority to the, to the county government to establish a land bank, and in doing that, you should know that every su taxing subdivision had to give up some money, right? And if we had gone to those various taxing subdivisions and asked for the authority, there's a pretty good chance that would have been a problem. In fact, the loud, loudest objections came from Bay Village, which contributed $7,000 to this. But loudest objections. They wanted to lead the charge in Columbus. But the point is, you can go to Columbus, and you could ask for a special set of authority, uh, uh, authority to, to allow county government to do what, other, what county government cannot do now. You might be surprised. Columbus might be willing to do that. So I think, um, and, and I also think, speaking of housing, Tom, you know, between the development university circle and the one over here, the Beacon on E6, almost 400 units of housing. And I know, Matt, you guys got directly in the middle because people complained about the incentives you needed to make available. I think you should incentivize every downtown project, not at the expense of neighborhoods, but to bring middle-income people into downtown Cleveland, making sure we take advantage of their income tax. I didn't used to feel that way, but I do now, given the fact that there is no, there is no cavalry, there's nobody coming from Columbus, nobody coming from Washington, whatever solutions we arrive at have to be local. Steve, if I could just, I, I, before we go to Peter, the, the reason I said I think it's time that we as a region start looking to a metro form of government, and what I failed to mention in my earlier comments, in my ward, almost 30,000 people, 59 communities in the county. The population in my ward alone is greater than 50 of those communities in Cuyahoga County, 50. And, and so the balkanization of how we do land use planning, development, um, critical social service uh, delivery um, is an archaic and old model and it's time that we change. Uh, okay, what I wanna be sure to say here is that Tom is gonna have a, a chance to respond, especially to, to Jim, but first I wanna give Peter a chance respond. to- Respond, I agree with him. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yeah, let's hear from Peter first. Is this on? Yes, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there's really not much to disagree about. I mean, Tom's piece, uh, I too read the book beforehand. Um, there, there's not much you can debate because it, it is simply a snapshot of what our region suffers with now and what the history of how we got to this place. We, we stand here as um, those who have inherited 300 years of conquering our environment at the expense of everything else. Mm -hmm. That has been our MO as a country for over 300 years. And so stopping that train and, and pivoting and redirecting it is, is a monumental effort. And, and I agree with everything that's already been said in this direction here. That, that influence is so powerful that for most of us, when we say we're gonna do planning, that means we're gonna plan growth. We automatically assume that a plan means we have to grow. It, it has never meant we're going to plan something that is sustainable. Tom starts his book uh, talking about his experience in, in England, in London. Our view of history, our view of age, particularly around our urban environment is so different than Euro the European view that we are ingrained into thinking about replacement before we're finished concluding what we're doing today. We're already planning for its replacement. So this change, whether it comes from a, a, a more optimistic view in Columbus or Washington or going to metro government or uh, growth sharing, it, it is, requires a culture change that's, that's monumental for our country. And if we don't make it, then, then many cities will simply cease to exist. Um, the, the economic cycle, whether it's here or, or any other capitalist system, starts with jobs. The catalyst for the entire system is the creation of jobs, 
up here. And it's jobs that create demand for housing, not the other way around. Housing creates demand for community amenities, both commercial, like shopping and dining, and recreational, like parks, museums, arts, and culture. Those features make a community more attractive so that businesses locate there and create jobs. That's the cycle. And in Northeast Ohio, we have been stupidly focused on housing as our economic catalyst instead of on creating jobs, which is why residential real estate tax abatement is wrongheaded. And we shouldn't be doing it. What we should be doing, that $7 billion of residential tax value that Tom alluded to that was lost in Cleveland and those communities with common borders with Cleveland equates to an annual $140 million of lost real estate taxes. Now, whether you live in Cleveland Heights like I do and pay some of the highest real estate tax rates in the state, or you live in, in Solon or Westlake where the real estate tax rates are low, that $140 million that was lost, imagine what could have been done in those school systems that receive the majority of the real estate taxes. Or what if, instead of residential real estate tax, we took the abated taxes and put them in a metro government supervised civic job creation investment fund. For five or six years, accumulated $140 million a year. We could attract a lot of business here. I think Newark, I don't know, maybe Mayor Rittenauer knows best, offered the most in incentives to Amazon. I think like $7 billion in present value of incentives to relocate there. We could have competed with that if we wanted to. I mean, I, that, I'm not saying that that's a good policy, but we could have. I had, housing is an inefficient way to stimulate an economy because it's a one-time investment. It's a one-time expenditure and it has no economic return. It has emotional return, that, and I'm not suggesting that's unimportant, but it has no long-term value especially since we throw it away every 30 or 50 years. I had the opportunity in August to drive from Dallas to Austin and from the southern boundary, city boundary of Dallas to the northern city boundary of Austin is 190 miles. In those 190 miles, I passed nine new highway interchanges under construction not reconstruction, new interchanges under construction, and 13 new interchange widening. By widening, I mean at least two lanes. If it was one lane, I didn't count it. That means that I saw a new highway interchange every 21 miles and a highway widening every 15 miles, which pretty much means continuously. What's the infrastructure in our country that triggers creation of jobs? The city of Austin has added new residents in the last 10 years equal to the population of Cleveland. It's phenomenal. Because the state of Texas, they have a plan, right or wrong, they have a plan. We're going to build highways because we have a history that hi highways support growth. So maybe there's a different infrastructure that we need to emphasize. And of course, it, what a state we're in. If, if, if the people who are leaders here say, give up on Columbus, give up on Washington. As, frankly, we don't have enough resources to do it locally. We have to change Columbus or Washington somehow, or, or the cities will fail. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, Quick, quick uh, follow-up for, for Peter. I have to ask as an uh, architecture critic here, um, uh, we don't talk enough about what gets built for, for the, the price of that uh, home investment and the mortgage. Peter, uh, in your estimation, is the stuff that's getting built uh, these days uh, going to last beyond the life of a 30-year mortgage? Well, I'm talking materials, I'm talking quality of construction, all that new stuff that people want, uh, according to uh, Tom's uh, Tom's work, the stuff that they're buying, is it going to last? Well, physically and engineering-wise, yes. 
is, it, it could last 100 years. Um, the two by fours, the, uh, the yeah, vinyl, no, the, last. the asphalt shingles. We don't, we don't change housing because it's worn out. We don't replace regional malls because the physical infrastructure wore out. We change them because we changed our mind. <laughs> okay. All right, Tom. Uh, bunch, bunch of re bunch of reactions for you, uh, and yeah, grab grab the microphone here. Uh, we've got uh, Jim saying that uh, tax growth sharing won't work, uh, but he likes the uh, uh, the type of regionalism that uh, he sees in Louisville and uh, and Nashville. And it says the city government ought to do what it can to incentivize uh, downtown growth and and uh, capture revenues through the uh, the income tax. But Peter says don't do tax abatement. Uh, let's uh, take gather those monies instead and put them towards uh, uh, metro uh, scale uh, investment in uh, uh, job and a job growth program. Uh, what's your reaction to uh, any of that that you'd like to pick up on? And, and Matt, I'm sorry, Matt. Matt was talking about metro government. So, well, what I, the reason I wrote the book <laughs> was to purge myself, of course. But I think <laughs> is to is to hopefully add some spark to the conversation. I hate the term, the discussion or whatever. Add to the conversation, anyway, a popular term. That's what I would hope would happen. So, uh, is it on? Is the mic on? I was hoping that it would add to the conversation. And in what the four of you said, at least in this micro setting, that's what it's done. So, uh, I... I just, I would plead, I plead that you guys, you four, and any of you there in any way whatsoever, engage people under talking about these matters. I, I think the Nowaka quote where we're at a crossroads in various ways, it's true, it is the case. So let's dig in on it. And I think in particularly for the four of you here, think of two mayors who are closest to agreeing with the situation as it is, as we described it here, and go talk with them and say, this sounds terrible, but it's a way to do it, and tell them, read the book. <laughs> tell all those mayors, read the book. Now let's, let's talk about it, which is really what I was doing when I said NOACA, or the board ought to sit down and put it up on the wall. I mean, that's what it is. Look at the situation and talk about it. And that way, I think the answers will emerge. Mayor, I wanted to... Uh uh, ask you, uh, hearing the, the proposals from uh, the other three panelists, uh, what, what would your Rx for the regional future be? Let's, let's step aside from your, your role in Lorraine. What, what, what do you think the, the answer would be? I mean, in, in he, I agree with everything said about our state government. I, I think there has to be a change there. I, I think, as Peter said, there, there has to be, if you know, the telling sign is all of us are talking about what is wrong at that level or at the, the level of Washington, D.C. I think the change has to be there, and I think um, some of the ideas of, of looking at these other cities, uh, like Nashville, like Louisville, um, like a metro government, I'm sure the county executive can, can do a lot here um, just through leadership with the mayors, but the bottom line is, uh, I, I think, again, one of the themes in this book is the fact that there is not much support for these older cities that are trying to rebrand themselves, uh, redevelop. It's always the focus on the new. So, you know, my RX would be figuring out a way, whether it is those, you know, pulling together those incentives to provide, and I'm not just talking Lorraine, I'm talking a lot of these inner ring suburbs, and the scary part is it's gonna be the outer ring suburbs soon enough. I mean, these areas that are thought of as being untouchable they're not untouchable. And I think really it's got to start locally, but we have to figure out a way to get some assistance from the state to start putting a priority on these. I refer to them a lot of times as legacy cities, and they are legacy cities. Um, you know, the Lorraines, the Lyrias, the Parmas, the Cantons, and talking to the mayors, there's an identity crisis. We're not small enough to be a suburb. We're not large enough to be a major city, but this region has enough of them that if we continue to ignore the problem, um, I think the dire reality of this book is going to come true, and we're all going to be paying more and receiving a heck of a lot less service because of it. Tom, you want to interject? 
Yeah, I should have said, uh, you know, really read the book and identify two mayors because you're forming a political constituency, and that's what's needed. And I should mention the First Suburbs <coughs> Group organization, uh, currently led by Mayor Summers of Lakewood. I mean, that's, that group has been there for 20 years, First Suburbs, and they are a, a political constituency. The potency is still modest, but it's real. Now, the interesting thing is they have colleagues in Dayton. I mean, there are suburbs, beside the city of Dayton, there are suburbs in Dayton that are old and same thing, do-it-yourself survival. Cincinnati, Hamilton County, there's a slew of mini bitty little suburbs down there, population 812 and such. I mean, they're small, all within Hamilton County, another constituency. I think if all the officials of all the jurisdictions that are severely negatively being felt today, most sincerely, seriously, if they all got in the room at the same time, and by the way, about 20 years ago, a lot of those first suburbs groups from Dayton, from Toledo, from Montgomery County, they, they were here, they met. But if they all got in the room at the same time, I think they would begin to hammer out a, a, an agenda for, for, for dealing with Columbus. Thanks. I, I want to see if we can tease out one more layer on the ideas that have been put forth here. And Jim, I wanted to uh, come back to you and, and ask you what uh, additional powers you think uh, Cuyahoga County should seek from the state. Well, if you're going to move, let, let's assume that, and I agree, first of all, that I like the Louisville example, but I think that'll be tough. Okay, in what, what do you mean by the Louisville so example? That's Unigov. Basically, the, the, the population of Louisville grew up from whatever it was to close to a million because basically it became one entity. Am I correct to the president of the National League of Cities? It's so Unigov. In the early 60s, um, the metro region put a referendum on the ballot and they voted for it. It was such dire times. And then they created a uniform, uh, uniform uh, single metro government uh, led by a single elected executive and a regional council. So if you were to approach the state and say we're looking to create a unique authority in Cuyahoga County that gives the county council some unique authorities in the area of taxation where they could levy beyond what's presently allowed or they could do something that creates a revenue stream that could give the county uh, power to incentivize some of the, the, uh, the efficiencies you know could be achieved by bringing those various branches of government together. I'm just saying if you gave the county unique, look, on the land bank authority, we gave the commissioners and the treasurer the right to go out and establish a county land bank with the authority to take tax dollars and with the ability to take property quickly and hold it on behalf of the county right. land reutilization corporation. And it was a year-long struggle. And ultimately, they said, we're only going to give it to one county, your county. But within a year and a half, it was so successful that authority was extended to another 43 counties. And within four years, it was extended to every county in the state. So I think if we get our act together and find out what exactly it is we want the county government to do, what authorities we want to give it, obviously revenue is a big one. And Peter, I don't disagree with you on jobs, but this is a housing conference and not a jobs conference. And I, also, <laughs> I also have to tell you, but I agree though, but I also have to tell you that we did over 600 units of tax abated property when I was a councilman in Cleveland. They're all paying property taxes now. And for me, it was bringing a middle class population into my community and the stability they brought that I thought was critical. And I understand that if you talk to some of the people building this stuff at the Beacon, they'll tell you, you know, a lot of these projects worked in downtown, they call it baklava funding. I like that because I'm Greek, but it's lots of different layers. That's why when you talk about all these credits disappearing, you realize some of this stuff is not going to happen without them. So I think in the long term it is worth it. Yes, in the short term you give it up. And I also don't think a lot of it would occur without the abatement. But in any event, um, I think the county, and it should be Armin Budish. Uh, okay, uh, I was going to ask, who, who's, it whose be, job is it? It should be the county executive. should be the county executive. There are people here from Maple Heights, and there's South Euclid, and there's suburbs. And, and it's been stated earlier that some of these communities are struggling, and they are, though I would argue they're in better condition than people give them credit for. Tony, you know, we did the survey there. We just did a five-city survey, just like we did in Cleveland and East Cleveland, of five inner ring suburbs, Euclid, South Euclid, Warrensville, Maple, and Garfield. And contrary to popular opinion, they are in really very, very good shape. We did the same thing in the rain, and I always tell the story. I met a young mayor who, when I asked him, I said, how many houses do you think are in really bad shape? 
in the rain, Ohio. He said at least a thousand. And we did the survey. And as you know, Mary, I came back. I said I got good news and bad news. Bad news is you're wrong in your number. The good news is you could take credit for reducing it from a thousand to three hundred, because in fact, contrary to popular opinion, the rain is actually, other than the business sticks, in really good shape. Chase, you'd agree, right? I would. I mean, neighborhoods are holding together. They are holding together. Neighbors in Lorraine are very stable. So I think the, the, the discussion has to be led by the future president of NOACA. He should bring together mayors and people in this room. And I, I think that would be, um, that's where the discussion needs to be held. Matt, you, you are an advocate of uh, metro government. Is this what you're talking about? All right, it's or do you have another vision? No, I, I think that's precisely where we need to s start. And, and I wouldn't limit it to just, um, giving the county the taxing authority to create a pool of funds for economic development activity. It's time we start looking at all segments of what government delivers. Um, education, housing, uh, senior citizens, um, all of the social ills that plague uh, the city of Cleveland play, are starting now to plague our inner ring suburbs and our outer ring suburbs. It's, it's time that we start electing or we move to this type of, of government so we can do a better delivery model, uh, service delivery model for, for the citizens. You know, I first met Tom in, in um, I actually worked with his son Mike uh, for a short while, but I, I met Tom in 2008 when I was asked to join the Regional Prosperity Initiative. And uh, we met faithfully every month uh, for about six years, um, working on uh, a framework that would at least now allow this dialogue to enter the public realm. We, we did hundreds and hundreds of meetings, and, and there is some movement within state government, uh, but for Northeast Ohio, for Cuyahoga County, I don't think it's just enough to get land use planning and sharing revenue within um, Northeast Ohio. And we need to take it a step further, particularly in, the, in, in one of the oldest um, counties uh, in Ohio, which is Cuyahoga. Uh, Peter, I want to get a, a, a private sector uh, response to this. If we had the kind of uh, uh, regional government that's being discussed here for Cuyahoga, how would that change your life and how uh, specifically at, 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 in a place like Shaker Square? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to answer, I'm going to respond to Rakakis. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so how many units of tax abated housing did you develop in your award? Uh, about 500. 500. Fair to say they each had a value of $100,000? Uh, yeah. Then. So the, tax, the taxes that were abated per year for those 15 years was well over half a million dollars. I I've done it. Do the math. <laughs> it's well over $500,000 a year. Multiply that by the 15 years for each of those tax abatements. Of course it worked. I mean, it's, it's such a tremendous that's assuming, incentive. That's assuming so it would have been we, built. we do it because it will attract people now instead of doing it because of what, what the result will be down the road. Okay, now to answer Steve's question before Jim gets back in. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is, it is a challenge in our region to deal with the fragmented. I mean, the fragmentation of government is not only an issue for, you know, uh, I mean, Matt referred to, you know, the number of taxing districts and, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, mind-numbing to try to keep track. But in terms of moving forward with uh, projects that have regional impact, you know, the fact that there are so many jurisdictions means that a single jurisdiction may be supporting or not a project that has impact far beyond the boundaries of that jurisdiction. So either from the standpoint of getting something approved or helping plan it for regional impact, the fragmentation is, is an obstacle. Well, Shaker Square is cert certainly fits that description of, of uh, something local that has uh, regional impact. Jim, do you want to respond to uh, <laughs> what Peter was saying? Last <laughs> Each of those developers, you knew them, Sanford Campbell, Alan Krulak, um, I asked them, but for the abatement, would you have built? And the answer, of course, probably was self-serving, Peter, but the answer was no. Oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah. So the question is, can you really count that as revenue if, in fact, those projects would not have been built? Uh, you look at what's being built at E6 by, um, uh, well, what's his name, the, the, the beacon on the corner of E6. Uh, he built Stark. Crocker Park. Stark, yeah. Would that project be occurring without the multiple levels of um, 
incentives. Yes. And that, so my point is, if we took those, the funds that we are investing in incentives, and I, look, I've been the beneficiary in his ward, one of the first projects we did in the city of Cleveland. I'm glad you had, brought that up. Had a lot. <laughs> it, it did not include tax abatement. We did not get tax abatement on that project. No, no. Because the city would not grant it for commercial. But if we invested in jobs, we would, like other communities, the cost of housing would adjust. I mean, we are such an affordable community. But we also, as uh, yeah. Tom mentioned, you know, our median household income is lower than uh, similar, like Minnesota, similar sized communities to ours. If we brought better paying jobs here, um, Amazon's great, but they're not the best paying jobs. You know, if we really had a focus on bringing new businesses here, take the health tech corridor and multiply it 10 times or 20 times in other arenas that we could be successful in, those houses would get built. So, th thanks, Peter. Uh, to, to the audience, uh, you, you've got an incredible opportunity here with this panel to address these burning issues. I'd love to hear some questions. Yes, Howard. Well, I'll answer a piece of it. What was inevitable was the extent of, of the oversupply. That was inevitable, and the consequent city losing half of its 1960 properties. That was unstoppable. No mayor could, or no council could have done anything about it. That's inevitable. The response to it is another matter now, and Matt is going to speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, we, we have a golden opportunity in our city. Um, I think thinking is changing around these p types of policy issues. Um, Tom mentioned it earlier, or Steve might have mentioned it in his opening remarks. Uh, our city, our infrastructure, our, as Steve mentioned, our roads, our bridges, our schools, our places of worship, and our housing stock was built for a million people. Uh, 1970, we were almost 800,000, city of Cleveland and the county was 1.5 million. Today, we're just under 400,000. The county's 1.3 million. So the city's lost half its population. The county's lost 200,000. We are now, as a city, able to right-size our city and deal with it in a way um, uh, and, and deal with our, our archaic zoning code to allow the future build-out and the future development to occur in a right, smart, sustainable way. Let's face it. Uh, our transportation often dictates where the housing goes, and our housing patterns often dictate where the transportation goes. We should lead with an environmental goal, right? No environmental degradation. We're going to make sure that, that it's net neutral or positive gain in terms of environmental and sustainable efficiency. That's what you could do if you move towards, I believe, a regional government. Even though Cuyahoga County is primarily built out, they're still building in, in, in Strongsville. Uh, that sucking sound that's happening 
to the city of Brook Park, it's not going to Strongsville. It's going out to Medina County. And, and, and people who are leaving West Park, they're not even going to Avon anymore. They're going out to Vermilion. Uh, it is an unsustainable model, but if we could create a smart regional government, we could be a louder voice within not only Northeast Ohio, but within state government and state policy and really start to change uh, uh, the way decisions are made. I will give credit to President Obama. In 2010, our organization, the National League of Cities, we lobbied to break down the silos. You had DOT who was not talking to HUD and was not talking to the EPA. And he, President Obama created this cluster that EPA, DOT, and HUD were all in the same room making decisions. Um, the new administration in Washington has done away with that policy working framework. I know that the MPOs were uh, advocating for that. I, I, we need your help to, 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 to ring that bell. And I think that's some of the promising things that are on the horizon. You know, following on to, uh, to Howard's question, uh, one thing you, you didn't mention was uh, the over-reliance of uh, our city and region on a big, fancy, uh, magic bullet, uh, top-down uh, projects uh, conceived by small groups of community and civic leaders, uh, such as the, the recent uh, uh, renovation proposed for the queue. Uh, now, the, the Amazon uh, proposal for, uh, for Cleveland is another example of that kind of thinking, but you know, one goes back and you know, we could debate the merits of uh, uh, Gateway and the Lakefront Stadium and all those kinds of things. Uh, there's a new book coming out by uh, Mark Souther, another uh, CSU faculty member, called Believing in Cleveland, uh, which I believe will show that this recent history that we're talking about and this style of leadership with you know, the, the big things being decided in a little room where you, know, you little folks aren't uh, uh, smart enough or important enough to know about until we roll it out uh, in the pages of The Plain Dealer and at one time the Cleveland Press, uh, that's uh, hopefully going to change. Uh, Matt, do you, do you have any uh, thoughts about that kind of leadership style and where that's led uh, Cleveland and Northeast Ohio? Uh, <laughs> great load of question. Uh, <laughs> so I'll focus on something positive and related to your question. Thanks. Uh, in, in, in my neighborhood where I live, um, since 2008, we've created over 110 new businesses, over 1,000 jobs, returning nearly $4 million in sales and income tax back to this region. And we did it smart. We, um, there's no chains that are part of it. Um, when you look at these big bang projects, we were able to very slowly and methodically create over 1,000 jobs with the help of Nick Vitor when he used to work in our community. Now he's doing great things in Shaker Heights. Um, that's, that's how you build strong communities. Uh, it's always been my leadership style that um, I engage uh, the constituency along the way when we do it. And sometimes when we push all our, 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 our chips in the center on a, on a big project, um, it doesn't pan out. Um, we could go on about the Q deal, but I, I just wanted to give an example about, again, how you can be very intentional and strategic and create a lot of jobs and a lot of wealth for people. because. Those jobs are benefiting people who live in that neighborhood because most of the people who are employed live in that same neighborhood. I think we have time for more questions. A couple more questions. Yes. So we were clean up nice to have a world famous dispatch center. That only took eight years, uh, quarter of a million dollars, countless meetings, and it's seven cities with a microphone, as far as I can tell, up at seven centers. The pace of this is very slow. I wonder how long it will be before the dispatch center grows from the seven cities and all this effort to a larger, more complex communication system. I mean, once they start talking, you know, I remember trying to merge the University Heights and Cleveland Heights. I forget who was, who was the councilman, but he had his head handed to him when he came back from University Heights. I mean, it just wasn't going to happen like 10 years ago. What are the possibilities on a very lower level to try to get some of these things done and you get some of the fire chiefs working with each other and dispatch centers. I mean, what is the possibility of making these things happen? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to answer really quick and then I've got to run to another meeting down the street. My apologies. But, you know, we're dealing with the same thing in Lorain County with dispatch and these other, these other examples of where we're trying to bring people, cities together. And I, I think it has to start with leadership. I think it has to start with the fact that 
you've got to have the right mentality in place to try to get some of these things done. And I don't, by, by new leadership, I don't necessarily mean age per se, but uh, I deal with it. It's, it's the old way of doing things. It's, it's, hey, we want to be autonomous. We want our name on the sign. We want our name on the, on the truck. And everybody talks about regionalization as, you know, that we got to work together more. Let's collaborate. And you said it yourself, uh, Professor, in your book about uh, when you're talking about business, all the mayors are happy, they're back, pay, yeah, we're, we're pals, good luck to you. We're not thinking good luck. We're thinking we hope you stumble because we want it to move to our city. That's what we're, we're really thinking. Um, and regionalization is the same thing. It sounds good on paper. How do, you get the, how do you get the person in office who has the will to want to do it and look out for the betterment of, of the whole? I think it's a leadership issue. I think it's a mentality issue. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I run up against it, and you're right. It takes seven, eight years just to, to get it to a point where, um, you know, where, where people are talking and, and where they're, you know, trying to get something done. I don't know that there's any magic bullet, unfortunately. Um, I, I think you've got to elect people to office who believe in those things, and uh, I've said it all along. I've encouraged countless groups. We need people to run for office because, you know, these problems confounding society, I think need that approach. Um, I, I try as best I can not to look as insulated into Lorraine a, as possible. At the same time, knowing the rules of the game, I don't control them. I don't control the rules of taxation that made Lorraine have to put in a proposal for Amazon as opposed to joining Cleveland. I don't control those rules. But uh, as much as we can, I, I think you, you have to step outside of the, the parochial view of things. And it's difficult. Yes. Thanks, Mayor. In our area, um, the school budget is twice that of our city. So that's probably replicated all over the place. We're expensive. And as you know, most of our property taxes are lost to the city and schools overall. Simultaneously, you also mentioned that some of this stuff in the state constitution, the way public education is funded, is unconstitutional. There's new visions that have come up that way. And yet, with the way the state funds things, districts are going to likely have to What school district, by the way? Well, I used to collect property taxes. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm told most of it went to schools, right? Um, and by the way, you guys do a great job. I've loved, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really impressed by the, the district and not just the new construction, but the diversity of your system and how well you've done. Um, I think the formula has to be expanded. And this is, since I'm not running for office, I can say this now. I'm done. Ask my wife. Um, what about experimenting with sharing local income taxes, looking at other sources of revenue beyond property taxes? Um, the state, um, and, and by, I want to make clear something. I'm not saying we give up on people at the state and federal level. If I left that impression, but I'm with the 501c3, and I can't advocate defeat or uh, election of anybody from any party or any cat. I probably have already over, crossed over the line today. <laughs> but I think that uh, some of the more creative solutions I've seen are ones that consider sharing income tax. And I know there's this one project downtown that said they're just going to write a big check to the, to the Cleveland schools to kind of offset some of what they're going to be uh, giving up in the way of property taxes. But uh, again, I, I think those are discussions that could be, should be at the state level. This is something, as you know, education funding has been ruled unconstitutional how many times? Four. Four? A four? Okay, four. geez. I thought it was only three. Um, and that we should, those discussions should be initiated. Maybe they're initiated local and then taken down to Columbus. I know there is some precedent for sharing some income taxes in a couple districts around the state with school districts. Um, I think that's one option something that concerns me about the question you asked that's happening right now uh, within Congress is tax reform. 
um, SALT is the acronym they use, state and local tax uh, reform. Uh, and, and the leadership in the, the House uh, who's leading this, Kevin McCarthy, who's a congressman from California, um, wants to eliminate uh, many of the, uh, uh, the opportunities that school districts have employed to educate our, ch our children. And what's going to happen is the way we've been able to sell school levies within Northeast Ohio, in Lakewood, um, in Cleveland, in other communities, is that you can declare it on your federal taxes. So now we have bit the bullet because the state now unconstitutionally doesn't know how to fund school systems, so we raise our taxes voluntarily. And we use as part of that where you can claim it and get a deduction on your taxes. So now they want to remove that after we've already voted by the people to, to, to put that into play. Um, it gives me, gives me great concern. Um, you know, it's sad that we have kids in some school districts who don't even have books, and then in school systems like Beach where they're all getting iPads. Uh, there's a better way that we can equitably fund schools and fund public education, um, and I think it's moving towards uh, a, a regional form of government. Other questions? I think we're going to say that this has been a truly fantastic conversation. Are there closing remarks? Or? No, I just want to say uh, the mums are there for you to take. I don't want to take them back. What? Oh, I'm still here. The mums are in the front. I said, figure it out. The mums are in the front. 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 They're fresh. They have a wife with at least 12 days. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to add a uh, special thanks to our, our panel. I think this has been a fantastic discussion. Really appreciate it.